the angel is Christ. And at the bottom of page 11, you will see um, under the, the title of the mighty angel, you'll see the passage from Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, volume 7, page 971. It continues on to the next page where we draw several arguments to identify what the seven thunders in Revelation 10 are dealing with. So when I say that the mighty angel that comes down in Revelation 10 is Christ, you will find Sister White saying that in this passage. When I say the little book that's open in his hand is the book of Daniel, Sister White says that in this passage. So that's why that's in here. I don't intend to read that. I never did. This is this is for your own re point of reference because I'm going to make some claims about Revelation 10 and just point you to that to test it out on your own. What I understand the seven thunders to represent among other things is the repetition of the Millerite history in the history of the 144,000. Now if you go through the reform lines you will demonstrate that every reform movement parallels all the others and the characteristics that took place in the Millerite history will be repeated in the reform movement of the 144,000. So the fact that the Millerite history is repeated in the history of the 144,000 can be convincingly and clearly demonstrated simply with the presentation of the reform lines. Okay, that's just one argument. But I want to give you another one as we start to make our case that the seven thunders represent this repetition of history also. Sister White tells us under the experience of Adventism there on your notes in Great Controversy 393 that the parable of the ten virgins of Matthew 25 also illustrates the experience of the Adventist people. So one of the things that, ex that represents Adventism is the parable of the ten virgins and then in Review and Herald, August 19th, 18th, 90, she, is a, she says, I am often referred to the parable of the ten virgins, five of whom were wise and five foolish. This parable has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter, for it has special application to this time, and like the third angel's message, has been fulfilled and will continue to be present truth till the close of time. In the Great Controversy, Sister White identifies that the parable of the ten virgin was fulfilled in the history of the Millerites. If you've read the Great Controversy, you know that. They fulfilled, the Millerites, in their reform time period, fulfilled the parable of the ten virgins to the very letter, and here Sister White says that it's fulfilled again to the very letter. This is another argument demonstrating that the Millerite history is repeated in the history of the 144,000. It's interesting if we would have had time to to deal with the reform lines, which we didn't, you can demonstrate that the time of the end, the time of the end is always the fulfillment of the prophecy that sheds light upon the upcoming generation. And the time of the end in the history of Christ was the birth of Christ. The, there was a prophecy that predicted that Christ would be born. And when he was born... The time of the end arrived for that generation and there was an increase of knowledge in agreement with the definition of the time of the end in Daniel 12. And there were students of prophecy in the history of Christ that were running to and fro in God's word that were understanding that increase of knowledge. You had the shepherds on the hill. You had the wise men from the east. You had Anna and Simeon in the temple. And a continued increase of knowledge. You have Jesus in the temple when he's 12 years old. Um, so there, there's in that history illustrated an increase of knowledge and then John the Baptist is raised up to formalize the message of that time period. Then John the Baptist's message is empowered when the dove comes down on Christ at his baptism. Then the Sanhedrin chooses that Christ should die, the activities of the enemies. Then this message is empowered at the triumphal entry of Christ into Jerusalem just before the cross and Sister White uses the tri history of the triumphal entry to illustrate the history of the midnight cry in the Millerite history. And then the cross is the judgment followed by the disappointment of the disciples. And of course, all of that history is paralleling Millerite history, but it's also par paralleling the reform movement of Moses. The Bible plainly teaches that Moses is a type of Christ. And the, his the reform movement of, of Moses, the time of the end for, for Moses, is the birth of Moses, which is the fulfillment of Abram's prophecy about how long the children of Israel were going to be in Egypt. 
So be, Moses as a type of Christ, the time of the end and the time of Christ was the birth of Christ, and the time of the end and the time of Moses is the birth of Moses. And there was an increase of knowledge about who Moses was and who was Moses. He was the one the Lord was going to raise up to bring the, God's children out of Egypt to the promised land. And the increase of knowledge is illustrated in the fact that he's taken into Pharaoh's court to learn the education of Pharaoh, but he's taken in with his mother who teaches him the education of the Bible. And the increase of knowledge is illustrated that the Egyptians, when he becomes a man, know who he is. They know he's the one that's been raised up to deliver them from Egypt. The message is formalized by Moses, paralleling the formalization by John the Baptist at the burning bush. He's given the message, go and let go back, I'm going to take my people out of Egypt. Just as John the Baptist had a message of reform, because this first message is always a reform me message. I didn't emphasize that yet, but it always is. Moses brought the message of Sabbath reform, which brought the response of Pharaoh saying, you're going to keep making the same amount of bricks even though you're taking Sabbath off and you're going to gather your own straw now. Followed by the, the plagues, which was a manifestation of the power of God, paralleling the triumphal entry, paralleling the midnight cry. Followed by the judgment of the firstborn. So he, he, as you carry it out, you'll see that the reform movement of Moses is identical to the form, reform movement of Christ, which is understandable because Moses is a type of Christ. But what you also find is that in the reform movement of Moses, this is the beginning of ancient Israel. Because at Sinai, when the Lord gives them the law, he enters into covenant with them. He marries them. They were married to, to the Lord when they came out of Egypt and he entered into covenant with them. And you know that they were married to him because at the stoning of Stephen, they were divorced of God. And you have to be married if you're going to be divorced. So what I'm saying here is the beginning in the, in the reform movement of Moses the, was the beginning of ancient Israel. And what was the end of ancient Israel? It was the reform movement of Christ. And Jesus, one of the, the characteristic that Christ identifies of himself more than any other characteristic in Revelation chapter 1, which is the introduction chapter to Revelation, is that he's the first, the last, the alpha, the omega, the beginning, and the ending. Which means that he's the God that illustrates the end with the beginning. And sure enough, he did it with ancient Israel. The beginning history of ancient Israel when they were married to Christ is identical to the ending history of ancient Israel when they were divorced. Do you see that? The beginning history is identical to the end. And perhaps the most significant symbol of modern Israel, and we're modern Israel, is ancient Israel. So if the beginning history of ancient Israel was identical to the ending history of ancient Israel, then it's acceptable to understand that the beginning history of modern Israel, which was the Millerites, will be identical to the ending history of modern Israel, which is the 144,000. You follow me? So the, the more you look in scriptures, the more you find the evidence that the Millerite history is repeated, as Sister White says here, concerning the parable of the ten virgins, the Millerite history is repeated to the very letter at the end of the world. Okay, and we're saying that the seven thunders is illustrating that. But, in verse 4 of Revelation 10, where we started, I, we didn't read verse 5. Let's turn to verse 5. Maybe I have verse 5 immediately thereafter. I don't. Turn to verse Revelation 10, verse 5. As soon as the seven thunders make their noise, in verse 4, it says, And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about, this is verse 4 I'm reading, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. Whatever the seven thunders were, they were sealed up. All right, so uh, in, in this passage that you have in your notes from Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, the long passage that begins on page 11, notice the the bottom paragraph on page 11. Sister White's commenting on Revelation 10. Everyone on page 11 of your notes? Okay, in the bottom paragraph it says, The special light given to John which was expressed in the seven thunders was a delineation of events that would transpire under the first and second angel's messages. Brothers and sisters, the first angel's message, if you look up here in this reform movement, in the history of the Millerites, technically the first angel's message arrives in 1798. 
okay, technically. And the second angel's message comes into history in June of 1842. And the third angel's message arrives on October 22nd, 1844. And Sister White says the seven thunders represent a delineation of events that would transpire under the first and second angel's message. She doesn't say third. She says first and second. So Sister White here is saying that the seven thunders represent the history of 1798 to 1844. Do you see that? She, in the next sentence, that she adds another important piece of information. She says, it was not best for the people to know these things, for their faith must necessarily be tested. As the Millerites went through this history, they didn't understand this history. And that's important to note, because when this history is repeated by the 144,000, unlike the Millerites, we are required to know this history. They didn't know it, we're required to know it. We have to know it. That's why Sister White says, we have nothing to fear for the future except as we forget the Lord's leading in our past history, teaching, and experience. Or we have everything, everything to fear for the future if we forget our past history. Because we have to remember this history. Our past history is this history. Follow me? The seven thunders represents the history of the first and second angel's message, which is 1798 to 1844. But in the same passage, if you go up two paragraphs to the second paragraph of this quotation, it says, after these seven thunders uttered their voices, the injunction comes to John as to Daniel in regard to the little book. What's an injunction? A command, okay? After the seven thunders uttered their voices, there's a command that comes to John, and it comes to John the same way the command came to Daniel, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered. When was there a command to Daniel to seal anything up? Daniel chapter 12. Daniel's told to seal up his book, right? Until when? So, so Sister White is here saying... This isn't me saying it. Sister White here is saying that the seven thunders that are sealed up in verse 4 of Revelation 10, that this is a parallel to the sealing up of the book of Daniel. Is she not saying that? But, and this is important to reference because we know that at the beginning of the Millerite history in 1798, the book of Daniel was unsealed. And this is the beginning of the history that she just said was the history of the seven thunders. And therefore, we're going to su suggest that it's the unsealing of the seven thunders at the end of the world that parallels the unsealing of the book of Daniel for the Millerites. The unsealing of the seven thunders at the end of the world is what is unsealed for the history of the 144,000. But let's read on. Going back to the second paragraph, she says, After these seven thunders uttered their voices, the injunction comes to John, as to Daniel in regard to the little book, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, these relate to future events that will be disclosed in their order. Now, two paragraphs later, she's saying the seven thunders represent a delineation of events that transpired during the first and second angel's message. She wrote this in 1901. So in the fourth paragraph, she's saying the seven thunders represents the history of 1798 to 1844, which is in the past. But in the second paragraph, she's saying the seven thunders represent future events that will be disclosed, will be disclosed in their order. Both places, their events. But she's once again identifying the principle that the Millerite history is repeated at the end of the world. The seven thunders represent the history of the Millerites from 1798 to 1844 and at the same time they're representing the history of the reform movement of the 144,000. Have I lost you? Probably a little bit, if this is new. Um, go with me now, if you would, to Revelation 22, verse 11. It says, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. What is this identifying? The close of human probation. Notice verse 10. And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of Ezekiel. Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book. What book? The book of Revelation. 
Evidently, there's a prophecy in the book of Revelation that is to be unsealed, because it says, for the time is at hand, and it's unsealed just before the close of probation. And there's only one prophecy in the book of Revelation that's been sealed up. The seven thunders. So what we're learning here is that just before probation closes, the seven thunders, whatever they represent, are unsealed. And we've already identified what they represent. They represent the truth that the Millerite history is repeated to the very letter at the, in the history of the development of the 144,000. Okay. Um... In each of these histories, in each of these histories, and I didn't spend a great deal of time on it, I've already acknowledged that, I'll try to quit doing that. In the Millerite history, William Miller was used to raise up the foundations of Adventism, which are the truths that are represented on the 1843 chart. In the history of the first decree, if you go to Ezra, chapter 1, and you read the history from the from the arrival of the first decree until the arrival of the second decree of Darius, you'll find that it's in the first decree that the foundation of the temple was raised up. In the history of Christ, the foundational message of that history was identified by John the Baptist. The Bible says, upon the testimony of two or three a thing shall be established on your own time. Read the first decree in Ezra. You'll see the foundation of the temple was laid right here. We're going to show you that William Miller laid the foundations in this history of the Millerites. But turn with me to Matthew 2 and I'll show you why I'm saying that um, John the Baptist l raised up the foundational message for his time period. In, in Matthew 3, I said 2, didn't I? Matthew 3 verse 5 Speaking of John the Baptist, it says, Then went out to, to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about the Jordan. One of the characteristics of this first message is it's worldwide. In the geographical setting of Christ, everyone came to hear John the Baptist. In the Millerite time period, in 1840, Sister White says, the first angel's message was carried to every mission station in the world. And in the first decree, read Ezra 1, Ezra says, I'm the king of all the kingdoms of the earth. So in verse 5 here, John the Baptist is putting in place that one of the characteristics of his work is that it was worldwide, like is a characteristic of this first way mark and all these reform movements. But then it says this, and what I'm saying is John the Baptist is the one that set forth the foundational message of that history. Verse 6 says, and were baptized of him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. And the foundational message of that time period was baptism and confession of sins. But he saw many of the Pharisees, verse 7, and Sadducees come to his baptism and said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? The foundational message of John the Baptist's time period was that there was a wrath coming. What was that wrath? Destruction of Jerusalem, AD 70. The Lord was divorcing his people and there was a wrath coming on this people in AD 70 and they needed to flee to the foot of the cross to the Savior to prepare for that wrath. That was foundational message that was set forth by John the Baptist. Verse 8, bring forth fruits, meet for repentance. They needed to repent for the condition that they were in. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father, for I send to you that God is able of these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Foundational to that time period was God was identifying that he was about to set aside ancient Israel and raise up the Christian church. And now also the la axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Foundational message of that time period is they were approaching the, the Pentecostal outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And John the Baptist, right here, is the one that laid the foundational message for that history. Just like William Miller laid the foundational message for that history. Just like... Cyrus, in the history of the first decree, the foundation of the temple was laid. Okay? The foundation is always, and why does that matter? Why does it matter to, to identify 
when the foundation is laid. Well, one of the reasons it's mattered is, you know, if you go to Noah, you'll find that Noah is paralleling John the Baptist. And Noah's work at that time period was to build an ark. Have you ever seen someone build a boat? I haven't built a boat, but have you ever seen one? What do they do first? They have to build a foundation to build that boat on. You have you ever seen him build these little, what well, I don't know what you call them, but jigs to build the boat on. Noah built the foundation. When Moses came, Moses' message was is that the Lord was going to take his people out into the desert to worship. But the reform message that Moses brought right here was that the Jews had quit keeping Sabbath. He brought a message of Sabbath reform and the foundation of true worship is what? The Sabbath. The foundation is always laid here. It's always laid here. And in Isaiah 58, 12, and I'm, and I'm not following my notes, so I'm probably blowing it. In Isaiah 58, 12, and Isaiah is speaking about the end of the world. He's speaking to you and I at the end of the world. And he says, they that be of thee. And he's speaking about God's people at the end of the world. He's speaking about the 144,000 in verse 12. He says, And they that be of thee shall build the old waste places and shall raise up the foundations of many generations. How will they raise up the foundations of many generations? They will do that by bringing reform line upon reform line and they will demonstrate as they bring line upon line with the message of refreshing, they will demonstrate the foundation of Moses, the foundation of Noah, the foundation of the temple, the foundation of John the Baptist, the foundation of William Miller. And why will they do that? Because there's a foundation of truth that the 144,000 will have to understand right here. It's always there. What's the foundation of the truth the 144,000 have to understand there? That's what this line upon line is teaching. That's what it's all about is the 144,000, the end of the world. And Isaiah 58, 12 is saying that one of the things that's accomplished by the 144,000 is that they raise up the foundation of many generations and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of past to dwell in. As they're raising up the foundations of many generations, they're also going to restore the past to dwell in. And now we can go back to our notes. And on page 12, you have Jeremiah 6, 16 and 17. He's going to identify what the paths to dwell in are. Thus saith the Lord, and, and Jeremiah is also speaking about the end of the world. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in, walk therein. Also I set watchmen over you, saying, Hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, I will not hearken. The old paths that are the paths to dwell in, that the 144,000 are going to restore in fulfillment of Isaiah 58.12, is a return to the foundational truths of Adventism. In this history for the 144,000, the Lord is going to take his Laodicean people that will participate in the work back to the foundations of Adventism and introduce them to truths that have been sealed up within Advent history. And he's going to establish them on those foundations. But there's going to be a shaking. Because there's a group that says, we won't walk in those old paths we're not going to listen, listen to the truths that are represented on those charts. We've determined those truths truth are a little bit faulty. They're a little bit shaky. That's what Jeremiah is saying. Is there's going to be a, a shaking over this. But the Lord says, the Lord will raise up watchmen in that history that will tell the people that are going back to the, the old past. What will the watchmen say? Hearken. Listen to the sound of what? Listen to the sound of the seven churches. Is that what he says? Listen to the sound of the seals? No. Listen to the sound of the trumpet. Hmm. The trumpet? Brothers and sisters, it was a message from the sixth trumpet, the second woe, that empowered the Millerites. And what we're saying is, that the third woe, the seventh trumpet, is the arrival 
of Islam into end time Bible prophecy and this marks when the mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down are you listening to the sound of the trumpet or is this stretching the word trumpet by Jeremiah too far out of context with John's use of the word trumpet in Revelation that bad biblical exegesis notice that in Jeremiah 6 16 he says if you walk in the good ways you'll find rest for your souls if you walk in the old paths if you walk in the foundations you'll find rest rest go to Isaiah where we started with in our last presentation Isaiah 28 verse 12 it says, to whom he said, this is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing. The rest and the refreshing are the same thing. And Sister White, we already defined. Sister White tells us what the refreshing is. What's the refreshing? Latter rain. So when Jeremiah says, if we'll return to the old past, to the foundational truths of Adventism, we're going to be receiving the latter rain. And brothers and sisters, we've already identified that the latter rain is a message. So in verse 17, when in Jeremiah 6, when Jeremiah says, Also I set watchmen over you, saying, Hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, they didn't say we won't walk in there, as they did in the previous verse. They said, we will not hearken. Once again, they refuse to listen to a message. There is a message. The message, according to the context of verse 17 of Jeremiah 6, it's the trumpet message. And it's the trumpet message that brings the refreshing that they won't listen to. So back, back to your notes. Manuscript Releases, Volume 4, page 246. I need to see. I need to look at these notes to make sure. Okay. Yeah, we're, in, we're, in, we're in good shape. I am instructed to say those that endeavor to tear down the foundation that has made us Seventh-day Adventists. And brothers and sisters, I want you to understand, I believe the truths represented on this chart are the foundations of Adventism. We're going to show that to you in a minute. We haven't shown that to you yet. But I want you to understand that if it's true that you need to factor that into this passage. All right, she's saying there's people that are going to try to tear down the foundations of Adventism. I'm instructed to say to those who endeavor to tear down the foundations that has made us Seventh-day Adventists, we are God's commandment keeping people. For the past 50 years, every phase of heresy has been brought to bear upon us to becloud our minds regarding the teaching of the word, especially concerning the ministration of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary and the message of heaven for these last days as given by the angels of Revelation 14, chap Revelation chap of the 14th chapter of Revelation. Messages of every order and kind have been urged upon Seventh-day Adventists to take the place of the truth which point by point has been sought out by prayerful study and testified to by the miracle working power of the Lord. But the way marks which have made us what we are are to be preserved and they will be preserved as God signified through his word and the testimonies of his spirit. He calls upon us to hold firmly with the grip of faith to the fundamental principles that are based upon unquestionable authority. Skipping the next paragraph to the last paragraph, it says, The Lord would have us at this time bring in the testimony written by those who are not now dead to speak in behalf of heavenly things. The Holy Spirit has given instruction for us in these last days. We are to repeat the testimonies that God has given his people, the testimonies that present clear conceptions of the truths of the sanctuary and show that the relation of Christ to the truths of the sanctuary so clearly brought to view. So she's warning us that the, the foundational principles that make up Seventh-day Adventists were under attack and she qualifies those truths as the truths that were established within the first 50 years of Adventism. And if you want to do an Ellen White CD-ROM on what she says about 50 years, when she talks about the first 50 years of Adventism, which takes you to like the 1890 time period, she says the truths that they were understanding then, 
those were sound. When you come to, basically, when you come to up to the 1888 time period, you're on pretty good ground. What they were understanding up until they decided that they were not going to receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, you're pretty safe ground. But, but after we rejected the offer of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, then things began to come into Adventism that began to cloud the issues of what the foundational truths were and are. Next quote. The Councils to Writers and Editors, page 28. God has given me light regarding our periodicals. What is it? He has said that the dead are to speak. How their works shall follow them. We are to repeat the words of the pioneers in our work who knew what it cost to search for the truth as for hidden treasure and who labored to lay the foundation of our work. The foundation of our work. They moved forward step by step under the influence of the Spirit of God. One by one these pioneers are passing away. The word given me is, let that which these men have written in the past be reproduced. Let the truths that are the foundation of our faith. What is the foundation of our faith? Even if we don't know what it is, what are they? They're truths. The foundation of our faith, let's be clear, are certain truths. Certain doctrines, doctrines certain understandings. The truths that are the foundations of our faith be kept, let the truths that are the foundation of our faith be kept before the people. We are now to understand what the pillars of our faith are, the truths that have made us as a people what we are, leading on step by step. So what are the foundational truths? Review and Herald, January 19th, 1905. God is not giving us a new message. We are to proclaim the message that in 1843 and 1844 brought us out of the other churches. In the Millerite history of 1840 to 1844, they estimate there were roughly 300 Millerite preachers. And every one of those preachers used this chart here exclusively to present that message. This is it. This is the only message they were proclaiming from 1842. This chart was produced in 1842. It's called the 1843 chart because it's predicting the end of the world in 1843. But from 1842 until the midnight cry time period just before 18, October 22nd, 1844, the only thing that all the Millerite preachers were using was that chart. And Sister White just said, God is not giving us a new message. We are to proclaim the message that in 1843 and 1844 brought us out of the other churches. And we just read quotes that we're supposed to repeat the words of the pioneers, reprint their articles. And when it comes to Islam, which is the subject, one of the primary subjects of our weekend here, the pioneers understood that those two horses on the lower right-hand corner with the warriors on them, that the one on top represented Islam of the fifth trumpet and I the one below, Islam of the sixth trumpet. And if you don't think it's so, then go ahead and get the words of the pioneers, the CD-ROM, and start reading the words of the pioneers that are on that CD-ROM. And that's what they understood the fifth and sixth trumpet to be. The first and second woe was Islam which they called Mohammedism, as you can see, reflected on that chart. Next quote, manuscript release number 760. God bids us give our time and strength to the work of preaching to the people the messages that stirred men and women in 1843 and 1844. The only message that they were preaching that stirred the men and women in 1843 and 1844 were the messages that were coming off that chart on the left. Do you, see, do you see my argument? Even if you don't accept it. And I don't have any reason that I can think of why you wouldn't accept it. It's pretty clear. The next quote. Manuscript release says volume 15 page 371. The truths that we received in 1841, 42, 43, and 44 are now to be studied and proclaimed. The message of the first, second, and third angels will in the future be proclaimed with a loud voice. They will be given with earnest determination and in the power of the Spirit. Now, now brothers and sisters, there, uh, I have many critics in Adventism. And one of the arguments that is presented about me is, I don't take any time to present the justification of by faith that is expressed in the third angel's message. 
here I am claiming to be involved with proclaiming the latter rain message but we know that when Jones and Ragnar brought the latter rain message in 1888 it was a message of righteousness by faith so why is it that Pippinger isn't spending any time identifying the righteousness by faith that's uh, represented in the third angel's message well I, I don't know that I agree with that accusation but I do want to point out something here Sister White has just tied the messages of 1842, 41, 42, 43, and 44 together and somehow suggest that those messages are the loud cry message. She says, the message of the first, second, and third angels will in the future be proclaimed with a loud voice. And when she says that, she's talking about the loud cry message. And the loud cry message is the message of Revelation 18. And the message of Revelation 18 is the latter rain message. Brothers and sisters, I don't think that you can give the latter rain message without emphasizing the truths that we received in 1841, 1842, 1843, and 1844. So if those critics would actually like to correct me and win me over to the truth, let them begin to uphold those truths and then maybe we can come together and discuss the time we should spend on dealing with the correct application of justification by faith, sanctification and righteousness by faith, which are easily available for any Seventh-day Adventist to understand in the Adventist bookstores and may very well be what we call in this time period milk. Notice the next quote. Review and Herald, April 14th, 1903. The warning has come. It, this is a warning. Kathy and I woke, woke up one night. I was living with a friend of mine. Um, <coughs> he's knocking out the door. He says, get up, the house is on fire. <laughs> and so I walk out in, my, in the middle of the night and sure enough, the house is on fire and it's on such raging fire that I go back in the bedroom and this, this just, it's a, not a cloud, it's thicker than a cloud, a cloud of smoke just fall on me and it's, I mean, it's so hot. I shut the door and I break the window out of our bedroom and we jump out of that bedroom with just what we were wearing each of the, within minutes because we were living in the desert out by Palmdale with the desert winds and the dryness out there within minutes that house was gone the warning has come this is a warning this is a warning here nothing is to be allowed to come in that will disturb the foundation of faith upon which we've been building ever since the message came in 1842, 1843, and 1844. Brothers and sisters, we've been warned. Don't let anything disturb the messages that are on those charts. I, am I misreading that statement? She calls it the foundation of the faith. She continues, I was in this message and ever since I've been standing before the world, true to the light that God has given me, we do not propose to take our feet off the platform on which they were placed as day by day we sought the Lord with earnest prayer seeking for light. Now, you, you know, brothers and sisters, Jeremiah says, if you can follow the logic, Isaiah and Jeremiah together, Isaiah 58, 12, and Jeremiah 6, 16 and 17, says that at the end of the world, when the 144,000 in this time period return to the foundations of Adventism, that the latter rain message will be connected to that and that there will be a shaking. The, there's going to be men that says, we will not walk in those old truths and we will not hearken to the sound of the trumpet. So, so we've been told that when this history gets here, there's going to be an argument, all right? And I've been confronted with, with people that flat tell me that's not the foundations. And when they tell, uh, those aren't the foundations, the truths represented on that chart. And when they're telling me that, they're also, they're also telling me that, you know, Sister White says that we're supposed to put Christ in the center of every presentation and you don't put Christ in the presentation at all. That kind of thing is thrown your way. I mean, perhaps it's correct, but let me, let, me, let me point something else here. I was in this message 
And ever since I've been standing before the world, true to the light that God has given us, we do not propose to take our feet off the platform on which they were placed as day by day we sought the Lord with earnest prayer seeking for light. Do you think I could give up the light that God has given me? And what's the light that God has given to her? The messages of 1842, 43, 44, which she hears defines as the foundation and platform. That's the light that God has given to her. But notice what she calls that light. It is to be as the rock of ages. Who's the rock of ages? Are you telling me that Sister White is saying that the foundational truths on that chart are Christ? They are, brothers and sisters. Because the Bible says no other foundation can any man lay than what? Jesus Christ. Every one of these foundations in each of these histories is Jesus Christ. And to oppose these foundational truths is to be fighting against Christ. According to the, my reading, she says, it's been guiding me ever since it was given. Next quote, Manuscript Releases, Volume 21, page 437. Some of the messages given from 1840 to 1844 are to be made forcible now. All? All? Brother, can you be sure about that? Do you, do, or do you still think that the message of the 2520 is to be made forcible now? Because, see, this message on this chart that is repeated on this chart, this chart is the chart that all 300 Millerite preachers used, and that means that all 300 Millerite preachers were teaching the 2520. But here at the end of the world, do you still think the 2520 is to be made forcible? Do you? <laughs> Perhaps. I had a brother, brother that's in town this weekend, tell me once, he says, Jeff, you know that Sister White is a careless writer. And at that point, our conversation ceased, and I've, I've never spoken to him again, although I have emailed with him. But when he was confronted with that conversation, he denied it. But as he continued on in the conversation, he told the people that were confronting him, you know that Sister White is not a theological writer. Hmm, whatever that means. I guess it means that if we understand theology, that we have a little bit better grasp of what Sister White was trying to say when she was writing, because she really was not a theological writer. She didn't get to the level to where she could express things theologically. Therefore, the theologians need to help her a little bit in some of those areas. Does, does she really mean that all the messages given from 1840 to 44 are now to be made forcible? For there are many who have lost their bearings. The messages are to go to all the churches. Christ said, Blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. Blessed are the eyes which saw the things that were seen in 1843 and 1844. The message was given, and there should be no delay in repeating the message, for the signs of the times are fulfilling. The closing work must be done. A great work will be done in a short time. Now, now this, is, this is what's where I stumble. A message will soon be given by God's appointment that will swell into a loud cry. Then Daniel will stand in his lot to give his testimony. Where I stumble here is from my understanding of the English. Sister White, once again, has tied the messages of 1840 to 44 that are represented onto that, those charts to the loud cry message. In other words, it, I can't give the loud cry message if I don't have some kind of connection with those truths. That's at minimum how I read that, and that's where I stumble because that's exactly what I believe. The loud cry message. If the loud cry message of Revelation 18 isn't built on that foundation, then it isn't the loud cry message. But, I'll give you an example. There's lots of examples on this chart. This right here. The 1290 to 1335. I mean, Adventism today, 20 years ago, 
the, the primary person, the primary person in Adventism that teaches that the 1290 and the 1335 are prophecies that are fulfilled at the end of the world in a day for a day fashion is a sister called Marion Barry. Probably 20, 25 years ago, with that type of prophetic understanding, which is absolutely incorrect, she wrote uh, a, an article or s a work that was going to be used for a Sabbath school quarterly on the Song of Solomon. And before it got put into the church family, the leadership of the Seventh-day Adventist Church realized, hey, the principles, the techniques that she's using prophetically are incorrect. And they shut the doors. She knew her, her study on the Song of Solomon was never put into the, to the General Conference Sabbath School quarterly, as was planned, and they shut her down. But since that time, she's written book after book after book, and as you travel the world, she's one of the authors in Adventism that has her books translated in, in all the prominent languages in the world, and all across Adventism, Adventism now, we've opened the door to the idea that the 1290 and the 1335 are prophecies at the end of the world that are fulfilled in a day for a day fashion. When the Sunday law arrives, the papacy rules for 1260 days, literal days, and, and then uh, the, the world Sunday law comes and there's 30 more days which brings you to the 1290 and then when you get to the fulfillment of the 1335 the blessing is is that Jesus announces the day and the hour of his coming just before his return and there's lots of variations on that but brothers and sisters if you believe that you're destroying the foundations of Adventism and 20-25 years ago the Seventh-day Adventist Church knew that but now today the probably the most famous evangelist in Adventism teaches that very thing and no one says anything but amen I have neighbors by me that follows this this brother and what they've done is they're looking for a good generator to put on their property because they know based upon applying this at the end of the world that there's going to be 1260 days of severe drought he's probably taking the 1260 days from Elijah and combining it with that and all they need is a good generator to get through that 1260 day time period and they're going to be okay and nobody says anything about it anymore because we're so deep in our Laodicean condition that we no longer understand the blessing of the 1335 because Daniel 12.12 12 says, Blessed is he who cometh through the 1335 days. And Sister White just told you what it was. The 1335 days ended in 1843. And we just read the quote, Blessed were the eyes that seen what took place in 1843. That's all fulfilled, brothers and sisters. The foundations are where we were supposed to be. And I'm here to tell you that the attack that we've been warned about was going to come on the foundations. It's full blown. I've got email documentation from the highest levels of Adventist theology, the Biblical Research Institute, that identifies that we're, we don't accept the 2520 anymore, nor do we accept the teaching of the trumpets of the Millerites. Of course, we don't teach what they understood about the daily either, do we? And, and if you don't accept what they teach about the daily, you destroy this particular prophecy too, which Sister Wright says is the foundation of the Adventist faith. <coughs> Why am I saying this? Not necessarily to attack the individuals that are involved, although I think they should be identified so that people can have a warning but I'm doing it for those of us in this room. As we're talking about going back to the foundations, brothers and sisters, the testimony about the foundations is that there's a warning connected that the foundations would come under attack as the history of Adventism progressed. And you need to understand that as you go back and look at the, the foundational truths. Because if you decide to accept them, then you have to teach them and when you teach them, you're going to run into brothers and sisters in Adventism that say, we won't walk therein, and we're not going to listen to the sound of the trumpet. Do you follow the logic? Even if it's incorrect. <laughs> it's pretty easy logic, okay? Notice, uh, General Conference Bulletin, April 1st, 1903. Those who stand as teachers and leaders in our institutions are to be sound in the faith and the principles of the third angel's message. God wants, him, wants his people to know that we have the message as he gave it to us in 1843 and 1844. The message he gave to us in 1843 and 44 evidently possesses the principles of the third angel's message. 
So what I'm saying is, and I gotta, I gotta close here, because even if we have more time on the tape, we don't want to be late for dinner, okay? <coughs> what I'm saying here to bring this back into the beginning and try to conclude it, is that Sister White says the sealing up of the seven thunders parallels the sealing up of the book of Daniel. In each of these reform movements, at the beginning, at the time of the end, there's a prophecy that's unsealed that produces an increase of knowledge that ultimately tests that generation. And Sister White is here telling us that the unsealing of the seven thunders parallels the unsealing of the book of Daniel. And the seven thunders represents the truth that the Millerite history is repeated to the very letter at the end of the world. But what is it that seals up truth? Spalding McGann, page 58. When Christ came to the earth, the traditions that had been handed down from generation to generation, the human interpretation of the scriptures hid from men the truth as it is in Jesus. The truth was buried beneath a mass of tradition. The spiritual import of the sacred volumes was lost, for in their unbelief men locked the door of the heavenly treasure. Darkness covered the earth, and gross darkness the people. Truth looked down from Er, heaven to earth, but nowhere was revealed the divine impress. A gloom like the pall of death overspread the earth, but the line of the tribe of Judah, he opened the seal that closed the book of divine instruction. The line of the tribe of Judah is Christ in Revelation chapter 5. And right here, Sister White's telling us that the book that is sealed with seven seals in chapter 4 and 5 of Revelation, it's the, the sacred volumes in the book of divine instruction. What's the sacred volumes in the book of divine instruction? It's the Bible. And it's Christ as the line of the tribe of Judah that unseals the truth to his people in each of these generations. And what was it that sealed the truth was traditions and customs that are handed down from generation to generation. Notice the next quote, Signs of the Times, May 17, 1905. The scribes and Pharisees professed to explain the scriptures, but they explained them in accordance with their own ideas and traditions. The customs and maxims became, their customs and maxims became more and more exacting. In a spiritual sense, the sacred work became to the people as a sealed book, closed to their comprehension. Could it be that from the beginning of Adventism to here at the end of the world that the foundational truths that were represented on those charts have been lost to Adventism because we've accepted traditions and customs and interpretations of what is true from other men that have been handed down from generation to generation? It happens in every generation. But there comes a point in time when the line of the tribe of Judah says, all right, I'm unsealing this message for this generation. Council to Sabbath School Work, page 47. When Christ came into the world to exemplify true religion and to exalt the principles that should govern the hearts and actions of men, falsehood had taken so deep a hold upon those who had so great light that they no longer comprehended the light and had no inclination to yield up tradition for truth. They rejected the heavenly teacher. They crucified the Lord of glory at, that they might retain their own customs and inventions. The very same spirit will not be manifested to Today. The very same spirit is manifested in the world today. Men are av averse to investigating truth lest their traditions should be disturbed and a new order of things should be brought in. There is with humanity a consistent liability to err and men are naturally inclined to exalt human ideas and knowledge while the divine and eternal is not discerned or appreciated. Review and Herald, November 22nd, 1892. It happened throughout every history. During the ages of apostasy, darkness covered the earth and gross darkness the people, but the Reformation aroused the inhabitants of the earth from their death-like slumber, and many turned away from their vanities and superstitions, from priests and penances, to serve the living God, to search in his holy word for truth as it as for hidden treasure, they began to diligently to work the mind of truth to clear away the rubbish of human opinion that had buried up the precious jewels of light. What I'm saying, brothers and sisters, is that when this reform movement of the 144,000, that all the other lines of reform movements are prefiguring and identifying, when this final reform movement of the 144,000 is fulfilled, 
that the starting point is the unsealing of a prophetic truth that will test this generation. And that it is Christ that unseals this truth that will test this generation. And the reason that these truths that will test this generation have been sealed up is because of the reception of traditions and customs that are handed down from generation to generation. And in this reform movement of the 144,000, when we reach the period after the angel comes down, and by the way, we're going to identify this weekend that we understand that the angel of Revelation 18 descended on September 11th, 2001. So we are after this point in time. That after this point in time, the foundational truth of the 144,000 will be established. And what I'm suggesting to you is that the foundational truth for the 144,000 is that they return to the foundational truths of Adventism that were established at the beginning. And when they do so, there's going to be a shaking like has never been witnessed in the Adventist church. Shall we pray? <coughs> Heavenly Father, we wish that uh, you would inform us through your spirit of how these truths represented on these charts are in force for us here at the end of the world. We wish to understand what the foundation is that so that we might participate in establishing and proclaiming the loud cry message that is built upon these truths. We thank you for the privilege to hear these things at this time in Earth's history. We know that we'll be held accountable for how we hear them and what we do with the message individually and held accountable for how we share this message with those around us. Give us the discernment to, to recognize our responsibility in hearing and promoting these messages and give us the courage to stand when the majority, possibly the majority, would turn upon us. We thank you um, for bringing us here this Sabbath. We ask that you now go with us as we break and uh, partake of some physical food and uh, help us prepare our thoughts, our minds, our conversations for the, for the Sabbath that's about to take place. In Jesus' name, amen.